Uh, we've been talking about greed. Uh, not last week because that was the yam party, but um, the two weeks before that. Um, and so this is just some. This is just some of the recap of what we talked about. First off, um, greed it can be de can be defined as the desire and or attempt to maintain ownership over something. So like we can be greedy with our money. We can gre be greedy with our life. Uh, we can be greedy with our possessions. Um, whatever it is, it's that idea of of I own this thing. Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a. I mean, as far as what we've been talking about um, in yams, that's a pretty um, precise definition. Um, so, and then we talked about last week how to overcome greed, or I'm sorry, two weeks ago, how to overcome greed, um, thankfully and persistently um, by giving much. So. The three steps there, you do it, uh, give thankfully, give persistently, and give much. That combats the attitude of greed, helps you to be able to um, to get past you. Um, we talked about how greed is more than just money. Um, and then we talked about the way that everything we are and have is a trust given to us by God. We talked about how we give tithes because it's a dedication of all of our money to God. Um, which we talked about this with the um, the whole uh, Old Testament thing and everything. Um, and so, any questions on what we talked about before um, before we get into um, this week's discussion? On, on this? Yes. Well, so there's some things in the past that I wanted to about greed. <coughs> Is that uh, I've chose to give, like for example, like um, my next door neighbor, uh, he likes to play video games, you know, he's a kid. Right. And I was nice enough to give him a password and hey, you know, here he's, he likes video games, you know, he's, he keeps him out of trouble, you know, right. and, and things like that. So I. I, I did that, you know, even though I didn't have to. Right. I, I did. I've done that. About money, I'm used to living in a certain way. Yeah. I'm going to have to talk about it, sorry. <laughs> I'm used to... Wait. Sorry, bud. <laughs> What was I, saying? I didn't know I did. That was very distracting for me. Yeah. <laughs> and about the money thing, money can make you greedy. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's a big deal because yeah. like you have to have money to live. You know? And I'm used to living and not you know I you know I I've been poor before. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm used to living with, you know, hanging on with just scraps and, you know, but then I still give. Yeah. I, I still give to people yeah. and stuff. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. I had, I had a good, uh, good idea about, you know, uh, really greed. Yeah. No matter what, no matter what, I, I just, you know, I try not to think about myself, just myself. Yeah. You guys had any questions about last week? Or, I mean, two weeks ago? No? Gracie, we're good? No. Okay. Um, so, we'll talk first off about um, some more about giving. Um, why is it not doing that? It's supposed to pop them up one at a time, and it's not doing it. It's not playing fair. Why even bother making PowerPoints if they're faulty? I'll tell you what. Somehow this is Ben's fault. I don't know how. Mark my words. The, uh, te the technology gods are, are angry that you've been working so much. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, giving is a necessary part to change our affections. And what that means is that naturally in the course of life, um, like Isaiah was talking about, uh, you kind of just get greedy with stuff. And not just money. I mean things in life we just naturally get greedy with. 
And the only way to really change that after it's already taken root, because it it will take root in your life, is uh, is to give. If you look in uh, Matthew six twenty through twenty one, it says. But lay it for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Um, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And it's a kind of idea that, um, you know, they kind of both go together. If you start storing up things on earth, eventually it will captivate your heart. Excuse me. But also, if your heart is already captivated, you're going to store up treasures on earth. So it's kind of that. Well, how do I re how do I readjust my affections? How do I change what, what my heart is set on? Well, the only way to do that is to combat it through the, through the process of giving. Um, and also, we were talking about this when I when I preached um, two Sundays ago. I talked about the way that that it ha sacrifices have to cost us something. And it's the same thing with when you're giving something. If you're giving out of your abundance and you it doesn't really cost you anything, it's not going to change your heart. You know what I mean? Like, I'll give you an example. Let's say I have 100 M&Ms, and I give you, like, one. There. See, I gave, so that way it'll change. Well, no. But, you see what I mean? Because I still gave out of greediness. You know what I mean? Like, maybe if it was something that actually cost me something that I felt. You know what I mean? You, you guys know what I mean? Like, um... Like, you had 100 of them, and then they say, like, uh, uh, some poor kid was starving, and like, ah, I'll give you one. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah. Um, so, like, if you have a meal, and maybe you're low on food for the month or something like that, and you don't really have the money to get to get more food, and uh, like the example Isaiah just gave, there's there's a kid and he needs food, and so like you gave you give him like a half or three fourths of your food, or maybe even the whole meal. So I mean, something that actually costs you something. You know what I mean? Where it's like it's past your convenience, and it's past um, because what we do is we do something like this. Oh, I have a few extra quarters on my dashboard, right? And I see some homeless guy, so I'm going to throw my money at him to make myself feel better about myself. See, I didn't really give to help him out, did I? I didn't really do anything to help him. I just gave him some money and went on my way. I didn't talk with the guy. I didn't see if there was anything that he actually needed. I didn't take any steps to help him out. I just threw some spare change in him so that way I feel better about myself. See what I mean? Well, that didn't that sacrifice didn't cost me anything. You know what I'm saying? And so when if you really want your affections to change, if you want if you want the things that your heart is set on to change, you have to give past where it's convenient to the place where it's actually like well, an inconvenience. I mean, there's no other way to say that. Um, and remember how we talked about money as an idea is security in this life. Remember that uh, Isaiah actually talked about this, and he wasn't even here. I mean, everybody knows it. Money equals security in this life. And so when we give away money, we give away parts that security in life. You know what I mean? Um, the, the money for rent, the money for food. Um, and so uh, giving takes away our security in life, but it accomplishes much more for the next. In a way, you could look at it like this. You're taking it out of um, your checking account, and you're putting it in a long-term investment account. See what I mean? It's an investment that's actually going to be worth something. Um, uh, and also, giving kind of destroys the whole coveting mentality. With with coveting, we always want something else. We always want what other people have. But when we give, we start looking at other people's um, um, despair and how we can help that despair in, from ourselves. You know what I mean? So it kind of combats the idea of covet me for myself and kind of gets the idea of giving for the sake of someone else. You know? Um, so... Um, um, another example um, of the coveting mentality that, that, that is a sign that's not working into our heart is when we charge other people for what costs us nothing. You know what I mean? Like uh, the, the Oasis got um, an air hockey table for free. You know what I mean? And, and, and I was kind of tempted to sell it for something. You know, But then the more Chuck and I started talking, the more I was like, well, we got it for free. We should probably just give it for free. You know what I mean? And it was really hard to overcome that mentality of, of but we could make something off of this. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. See what I mean? But you, you guys see where I'm going with this? Like, yeah. it, you don't charge somebody something else for something that costs you nothing. It's the same idea for, like, grace. You know what I mean? Like, some people do this. They get saved, and, and they, they, they learn about Jesus. And so what they try to do is they then try to charge other people for this. 
well, you have to wear the right clothes when you come to church, and you have to you have to do the right things when you come to church, and you have to do this, and you have to do this. It makes a thing where, although you received grace for free, you're now charging other people for grace because they have to conform to what you want in order to be welcome in the church. See what I mean? It's rooted in this idea of, of greed. I want things my way. It's my ownership. Um, or like when we give... Uh, when we give um, tithes or whatever, and, and we think that that means that the church has to be, you know, it, it's under our obligation, and the pastor we can manipulate him as we see fit because it's our money that we're tithing. You see what I mean? And we try to we try to give our money while still holding on to it, and it's just not possible. Um, another example is like let's say you get a really good deal on your car on buying a new car, and so you decide to sell your old car. Well. You could sell it for more expensive and try to really squeeze people dry, or you could try and extend the same hand of grace to others that was given to you. You know what I mean? Like, you got a car for a good deal, so give somebody else a car for a good deal. You know what I mean? Um, just that kind of mentality of, of, of uh, in giving, we are opened up to, to, to really the idea of showing grace to somebody, even if they don't deserve it. Um, yeah. So... Uh, as, a, as a general rule for giving, always side with people, not money or things. Always side with people. See, what we do is we side with the things. Um, and I'm going to show you examples of this later on, but like um, your kid breaks something, right? And so what do we do? We get mad at them, right? We side with the thing that was broken rather than with our kid. You see what I mean? Our, our kid needs our needs our help. They need you know th they need to feel validated. They need to feel like it's they're more important than the thing. But what we do is like we jump on them for the thing that they broke, even though you see what I mean. Even though they're more important than it. So we're siding with the thing rather than the person. You know what I mean? Uh, or you see people do this a lot too with like um, landlording and stuff, which is a hard thing. F I mean I'm a landlord, so I I get this. Um, you kind of want to squeeze people dry, you know what I mean? You kind of want to make sure that uh, that you're getting the money that you need, that, that, that they pay everything that, that that's due you and everything, which is fine, but remember that there's a person behind that check that you're getting. You know what I mean? It, it, you have to side with the side with the people, not with not with money or the things, which means you're going to get screwed over, just FYI. Whenever you side with people over things, you're going to get screwed over. Um, but anyways... Um, so share some examples of that. Should I lose the money or should I lose the friendship? Let's say you, God forbid, but let's say you decided to loan money to a friend or to family. Well, anybody who's known this will, will can tell you that this can this is a really quick way to really ruin things. You know what I mean? Makes it makes relationships very rocky. Um, oh my gosh, so many stories that pop up to my head that I, I don't really want to share any of them though. Um, and this idea of well. Out of the two, lose the money, not the friendship. You know what I mean? Side with the person. Um, someone using the church or caring for the church. Well, we could either let somebody have their wedding care for free or we could charge them so that we could do upkeep for the building. Well, see what I mean? Be a blessing to people. Side with the person. Just because, you know, hey, they're going to put some wear and tear on the building. That's okay. You know what I mean? It's okay to lose out. You guys get kind of what I'm talking about? Not seeing a whole lot of action from over there, so I don't know if I'm. You, can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, okay. Uh, I, was looking, uh, I think I have a uh, um, similar example to this. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, let's say it's in, like money, like. Um, let's say, let's say if you were to do something you weren't supposed to do, and you did it anyway. Like pooping in the street? <laughs> 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 and, uh... It's okay, like, friendship. Like, let's say if you have a friendship with somebody, and if something between you and that person is getting away in the friendship, you probably should stop doing something before it gets the, the friendship gets ruined right something like that mm -hmm. right. and then I already talked about this example the child or the broken lamp once again um, uh, here's another example um, when we hit like our 40s or 50s we have the desire to start remodeling everything and we're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars you know what I mean because if you pay somebody to do it 
capture model, usually one room is going to cost you excess of $10,000. Like, it's not that uncommon. Um, sometimes you'll get lucky and it'll be closer to like four or five thousand dollars, but for most major remodels, it's going to cost you like ten thousand dollars per room that you do. Um, and so then that, that that brings up the question: Well, do I do the home remodel or do I help people in need? See what I mean? And it kind of it's kind of that, that idea: Do I get a nicer house for me so that I can live in my nice house, or do I help somebody else? So you see where I'm going with this? He he gave this story. He gave this story in in his in, in his book um, Foster. Um, in this book, he gives us a story about um, how he wanted to go to uh, college, but he couldn't because he spent all his money caring for his parents who both took ill while he was in high school. So all of his college fund went to his parents, and so then he wanted to go on this missions trip, and so he he was able to get to get money together through a fundraiser. I don't really want to get into it, but. Um, and so he goes goes off, and when he gets back, he's like, well, I guess I'm not going to be able to go to college after all. So he gets a job, and he gets hired. And somebody in the church goes to him and says, well, what are your plans? And he says, well, I, I can't afford to go to college, so I'm just going to go work at this job. And they say, well, and then they, they, they get uh, some friends together, and them and their friends pay for his way through college. See what I mean? Like, well, they could have used that money to remodel their houses or, or to – you know, buy another car. See, see what I mean? But instead, they invested it into something that they thought was worth that they thought was worth was worth the cost. They sided with the person rather than just doing things for their own comfort. See what I mean? Um. So then, uh, another example. My ties are the mission of the church. Well, I give ties, so I want the church to do this or to do this or do this. Or, or do you give your ties because your money is dedicated to the Lord and you want to see more outreaches for people to be saved? See what I mean? Like the Harvest Fest. Do you know how many hundreds of dollars go into the, into the can, just the candy? I mean, we're not even talking about the time. It's just the candy that, that people donate. I mean, I don't know if you guys price candy for Halloween. It's not that cheap. It's really expensive. See what I mean? Well, we could use that money to, to remodel the entryway or something. I don't know. We pick something. We already remodeled the entryway. <laughs> uh, but you see what I mean? It, we could use it for something else. Well, yeah, or we could use it for people. See what I mean? Um, so also there's the idea that, um, um, oh, I don't want, I don't want to say that yet. I'll come back to that. Uh, so in, in one example is like the food pantry. Did you know that the food pantry puts a lot of wear and tear on the church? People who walk into the food pantry, they track in a lot of dirt and mud and that kind of stuff. And the chairs are getting torn up already and they're not that old. You know, the, 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 there's messes around. We have to have somebody come in on Wednesday to clean up. Wasn't that an inconvenience? Well, it's like pa pastors talking about from Proverbs, where there's no oxen, there's no crap to shovel. It says that in Proverbs. Well, what's the point there? Well, if you don't want to minister to anybody, just fix up the church real nice and shut the door and lock it. But in the meantime, the church is there for the purpose of reaching people. So does the food pantry put wear and tear on the church? Yes, but is the church there for people? Or are people there for the church? See what I mean? For a long time, it's been like that. People are there for the church. We have our nice buildings with our with our beautifully stained glass, with our perfect pews, and with all these different things, and it looks great. But the problem is, is it's not actually reaching out to anybody. It just kind of looks good, and it just sits there. It's a building. The church is supposed to be a people, an assembly of people in motion to other people. So, um, <clears throat> So it says in James, and we'll talk about this in a, in a second, not to, to show no partiality among people. In other words, if someone is rich or poor, it does it shouldn't matter to the church. In other words, money should mean nothing to the church. See what I mean? We have it. God's given it to us. We handle it well. Fine, whatever. Money doesn't mean anything, though, because God will do the providing for the church. We reach out to people. God will work out the rest. Um... And so then people kind of ask these kinds of questions. Well, I just don't want to get screwed over. Well, isn't God the provider, though? See what I mean? Are you trusting in your plans or are you trusting in God as you reach out to people? See what I mean? Sometimes we use this so much that we really just don't even see people anymore. You know what I mean? Um, so always choose the person, not the things. Always. Um, so towards a balanced perspective, because I know we've been talking about a lot with greed about you know handling money and giving money. That kind of sometimes raises up the wrong idea, and so I kind of want to clarify a few things. First off, work is good. Work is a good thing. The Bible always validates if you are able to work that you should be working. 
it talks about how you shouldn't be providing for people who are choosing not to work. Just because they're choosing not to work, you should always care for those people who can't tend for themselves first. See what I mean? It says that multiple times. Like, it, like um, uh, Paul – well, I don't know. I'm going to get into that one. But uh, what, what's the other one? There were two ones that are going – two verses that were going through my head, and I um, wanted to talk about the second one. Um, in uh, Second Thessalonians, it talks about – or maybe it's First Thessalonians. In one of the Thessalonians, it talks about how um, there's people – who are pretending to be doing stuff, but they're actually just busybodies. They're just going back and forth and not really accomplishing anything. And uh, then they're mooching off of others. And he says, this is just, this is not a good thing. Have them work, and then if they work, they can eat. But don't have them just mooch off. See, because what happens is if we waste our, our, our resources on people who can be doing something, we're not going to be able to reach those people who can't. So you know what I mean? It, it just... It's kind of like letting them use you. Right, yeah. And the church has limited resources, honestly. And so we have to think logically about who we can help. So you know I mean? We, we shouldn't give food... We shouldn't find the richest people in Tularosa and give them food, right? We should find the poor people to give them food, right? See what I mean? It makes more sense. <laughs> it makes more sense. <laughs> because we only have so many resources, so we need to give them, use them wisely. Um, so work is good. That That is a good thing. I'm not saying anything about that. If you are able to work, you should work. Um, but remember that human value comes before economic value. Always. Always human value comes before economic value. Every time. Now, that's something that, that, that can't, be, um, can't, be, can't be negotiated. Um, so our work and our actions must support this. When you have a job, when you're doing something, uh, you should always... If you're doing something that you feel is immoral and, and is and is dehumanizing people, get a different job. You know, like a lot of people have a problem with um, what are they called? Um, the uh, drones with with drones uh, because when they bomb a building, you don't know for sure if there were innocents in the building or not. So a lot of people have a hard time with that. Well, then you shouldn't work with drones. See, what I mean. It, it, if it's something that you feel is, is is dehumanizing people, taking value away from people, don't do it. You don't have to work at a job that is that you feel is immoral. That, that's you see what I mean. Like Nicole's job, she's helping people get get their medication. Well, does that value human life? Well, I would say so. Ben works works with works with people. Um, I don't know exactly how you how you describe your job, but I hope I don't butcher this too badly. He helps people who who, who need uh, who need home home care. See what I mean? Well, would is would you say that that's valuing life? Yes. Um, let's say you were a doctor who was giving abortions and you felt like that was immoral. Should you give abortions? Well, no. Stop. Go get a different job. See what I mean? If you're doing a job that you feel is immoral and doesn't value human life, don't do it. Go do something else. God honors that when you honor him. I'll give you a story of that. In Exodus, there's uh, there's these midwives, and, and Pharaoh goes to them and says, if there's a male born, you just kill him. Don't even worry about it. Just kill him. And it says that they feared God, so they didn't do it. Did they die for it? No. It, it, sh it shows that they lived, lived through it, um, and they were able to lie to the Pharaoh, and God preserved them through it. See what I mean? An immoral thing they didn't have to do. And the Lord watched out for them. Um, <clears throat> so discipline is good too. Correctly handling something. I'm not saying that you should give away everything everything that you possess. I'm not saying that at all. Um, I am saying that you shouldn't let, let things hold on to you. And discipline is definitely good. Learning how to correctly manage things is good. Because if you correctly handle something, you can help other people. See what I mean? If you give everything away, what can you give to the next person down the road? Well, nothing because you don't have anything to give. But if you correctly handle what you have, then you'll be able to reach people down the road. So, uh, how can valuing human life change the way we work? If we value human life, then we will be more focused on how our job people or provides for people rather than just a paycheck for us. Okay, so not just doing it for the money? Good. Uh, oh, are you finished? I'm done. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Okay, well, this is how can value human life, like valuing, is it like, you know, helping human life? Like, and then it says can change the way... Seeing people as important. Oh. If you see people as important, how will that change the way that you work? Well, that's, that's a good question. I don't have, like, the right, right words, but I'm, I'm, like, still working on my idea in my head of how to answer that. Oh, okay. Yeah. You guys got anything? Um, I think we'd do more for, um, like, going off of Chuck's idea, um, we would do more that would profit our boss than ourselves. Ooh, now there's a good one. Because our boss is a person, huh? Right. Uh-oh. Oh, like good one. Work, working for the wrong person. I thought of that. Or like working for, um, say you're at a job and, mm -hmm. uh, and you see the, you see the bright side of it and the negative sides and then why others don't. I mean, I don't know. I guess I don't have a really good answer for that one. <laughs> I dropped out of high school, so I kind of... I'm rusty. <laughs> so. I would think more that it changes how you see life as well. Okay. Because then you learn to appreciate more. Hmm. When you start to value human life, you start thinking things differently. Mm -hmm. No. You start oh, seeing you Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Appreciating the human life, mm. and then change how you used to work. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. If you guys heard what Nicole and Isaiah too was saying, um, the idea of, of just kind of appreciating your life more, um, and, and kind of like enjoying it. You know, like when you walk out or when you're driving home. Noticing the, the the mountains, you know, we live right by the mountains. It's easy just to drive by them every day, right? But have you ever have you recently just stopped and, and looked at the mountains, I mean, or just looked at the desert? You know, appreciating life, and that's I think what you guys are talking about, right? And uh, I'm, I'm getting a better idea of, of saying, um, you, and just enjoy it, enjoy, enjoy it while you can. Right. I'm I'm starting to actually do that now, like appreciating what I have. Are we talking about rioting and looting? What's that? Rioting and looting? <laughs> I'm just and kidding. Looting. I'm oh, just okay. kidding. It's funny because I didn't add it. Rioting and looting. The word looting? Uh -huh. I, I, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> uh, it's a funny ooh word. <laughs> I think also um, it will make you more compassionate and sympathetic towards the people instead of hardened towards them. Especially Can you say that again? It'll make you more compassionate and uh, sympathetic towards people instead of hardened towards people. You know, especially like working in a customer service job. Mm. Really easy. Ah. Yeah. Give him a bad vibe. Buddy. <laughs> Call centers, bud. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, just hearing like Joey stories and stuff, too. Oh, my gosh. Right? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Um, from this... I've heard somebody, I've heard people take something when I say something like this and change it to mean something like this. We need to help others to stop being so critical. And like, when there's other people at work that we need to, we need to teach them how to stop complaining so much. And, what? Like, no, no, we don't have to change everybody else around us. You guys get what I'm saying? Like, we don't have to change people around us. We need to learn how to respond to those people who are being negative. We need to learn how to, excuse me. How to maintain a good attitude. So I mean, we need to learn how to correctly hand, excuse me, correctly handle them, where we don't join in with nitpicking things. You know what I mean? Because then if you if you join in with them, you're gonna start seeing life the way that they're seeing life, and then you're not gonna enjoy your life because you're sitting around complaining about it all the time. Yeah. See what I mean? Like it's yeah. gonna be a chain reaction, and then you're gonna feed them. Where even when they're in a good mood, they're still gonna get me in a bad mood because you're gonna put them in a bad mood. See? <laughs> so, now we don't need to change the way everybody around us uh, sees things or how they act or how they talk or what they say. And 
it, we just can't, we just can't be worried and concerned with that kind of stuff. We need to be worried and concerned with how can we do what's right, Daddy. you know? Daddy. Okay, so James 5.12. You know, if you guys don't turn there when I'm turning there, it's just guys watching somebody else read a book. <laughs> Fine, don't laugh. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any uh, any uh, or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. So then there's the idea with money. With how to say this? With your money, let your no be no and your yes be yes. You know what I mean? Don't try to manipulate people with your money. Don't try to like, I'm giving it, but I'm giving with ulterior in, – ulterior – yes. yes. Ul I, that doesn't sound right in my mouth. It doesn't taste right either. Ulterior motives. <laughs> you know, don't give with the idea of what can I get out of this. You know what I mean? Let your yes be yes and your no be no, not just with what you say but with your conduct too. You know what I mean? Let, let, let your money either be given or not be given, but don't let it be given with stipulations. You know what I mean? Like, I, hey, I Chuck, I helped you pay for, I don't know, make something up, uh, your new wheelchair. So now you have to help me with, well, hold on now. See you know what I mean? Like, if you're giving with all these stipulations and manipulations and you're trying to get people out of people something, then you're not actually, you're not actually giving. Like, oh, I'm just giving so that I meet, meet my IRS quota so that I can use it as a, as a write-off. Well, so you're not actually concerned with helping people. You're concerned with getting a tax write-off. See what I mean? Like, not that it's wrong for businesses to do that, because that's a business. I'm talking about us as people. You know what I mean? Like, we, we don't have to be given over con to consumerism because our culture is. You know what I mean? Um, and then I wanted to read you a quote from the book. Um... We refuse never to. Um, we refuse never to take advantage of our neighbor. That is no guarantee that our neighbor will not take advantage of us. Just because we're not taking advantage of somebody else doesn't mean that they're not going to take advantage of us, and we have to be okay with that. In fact, they will take advantage of us. Have you ever guys seen seen on Facebook and stuff where it says, "Don't walk across an ocean for people who wouldn't even like." What, uh, uh, cross a bridge for you. Have you seen those kinds of things? Or, you know, don't do that for them if they're just gonna walk all over you. you don't be a door. Well, that's not really what we're talking about here. See what I mean? Do yes, do that. You because you can't guarantee what other people are going to say or do, but you can do the right thing. You know what I mean? And and, and it's between you and God, right? So that means if you do the wrong thing, and you know that you're doing the wrong thing. See what I mean? That's wrong not just for your own conscience, but that's wrong before God too. See what I mean? So, um, um, there is no guarantee that our neighbors won't, will not take advantage of us. In fact, they will take advantage of us. But trust is worth the risk because of its power to build community. Besides, as Paul put it, why not suffer wrong? Why not be defrauded? From 1 Corinthians 6, uh, verse 7. And why not? After all, it is only money, and there are many things of far greater value than money. If it's, the, if it's down to you losing out or, or positively impacting somebody else, Lose out on the money. See what I mean? That that's the idea that we have to do. Why not be defrauded? It's just money. See what I mean? Well, because because why? God gave it to you. You can take it back too. Do we have to be concerned with the manner that God takes the money back, or do we have to be concerned with doing wisely with what we have, right? So if we're defrauded, we're still going to see the see the value in the person, right? But I co-signed for their loan. I well, I'm sorry that it didn't work out how you wanted it to. But it didn't work out how you wanted it to. You can't change the way things that happened. You can say, oh, I wish that this would have happened, but at the end of the day, it still didn't happen. As Christians, our word is as good as our bond. Others may well take advantage of us, but perhaps, just perhaps, our willingness to be defrauded, defrauded rather than to break the bonds of community can witness to a better way. In other words, our willingness to not put money above a person may actually cause more community than trying to milk the money out of them anyways. See what I mean? No. Um, so that brings us to the idea of the vow of simplicity. Do you remember we were talking about the monks and, and how they kind of had this this vow where they where they would just no ownership of anything, right? So maybe maybe we don't actually have to follow something that 
strict, as we see a lot of examples in the Bible of people owning things, and it wasn't seen as a bad thing. Rather, how about a vow of simplicity? Rather than having an immaculate house, you could have a house. Rather than having ten cars, you could just have five. See what I mean? Rather than having, you know, all these... Well, maybe our minds and our hearts shouldn't be set on the things. Maybe our minds and our hearts should be set on the people. See what I mean? Live a simpler life, and then you'll have a fuller life. What we try to do, and what our culture is constantly telling us that we have to do, is if you want to be happy and content in life, you need more. Right? Because bigger is better. Everybody knows that. You have to be an idiot if you don't know that. Well, what if that's not true? So, I mean, what if? Just go out on a limb with me. What if that's just not true? So instead, as Christians, let's, let's have this idea, the vow of simplicity. Everything we have, we're giving to God. But we're not going to chase after things like the world does. Um, so whether we receive or we give, if we're in the time of growing in our life or in a time of, of shrinking in our lives, if we're in a time in our lives where, where, where God is, is blessing abundantly, or we're in our time when we feel like we relate more to Job in the Bible, trust God through that, through that time. So you I mean, because the thing is not, our trust is not set on the things, it's set on the God of the things, right? Excuse me. So we stand content with what we have. Excuse me. Oh man, those things really make me burp. Uh, trusting for what we need. You understand what that means? We're content with what we have. We're not always desiring for more and more and more. And we'll get into this when we talk about lust, okay? But we're content with what we have. And the things that we need that we don't have, we're trusting in God for. See what I mean? That's the idea of it. Well, what about let it be enough? Just let it be enough. Because if you're always looking for the next thing, there will always be a next thing. That's, I think, why pornography is such a big thing in our culture. I don't think it has so much to do with finding beautiful women online because oftentimes when you watch a porno, they really aren't that attractive anyways. So I really don't think that that's the issue. I think it's because we always want something else, something better, something more. You know what I mean? And pornography kind of gives us that opportunity. A, there's, I mean, oodles of porn on the internet. and I mean, you could literally search all day. And chances are you're not going to hit the video twice. Unless you look at a lot of porn. A lot of porn. In which case, you may hit the same video all once. <laughs> Download all of it. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> billions and billions of terabytes. Anyways. Um, so, the, you see what I mean? It's that idea of always wanting more. And I think that's the, that's the issue. I think if we addressed that issue in our hearts, I think the pornography wouldn't be as big of an issue. I think it would be an issue, but not as big as it is. Um... So also there's the idea that when we give up ownership, we're not chasing after the things anymore. God, this is your money. This is your life. You know, all of a sudden, that frees us. We're not, we're not, we're not worrying about stuff so, so much because it's God's. So, I mean, it, it frees us from that necessity of worrying. It's something where our lives become simpler. They become easier. It's like letting loose a, a bondage. Um, living simply allows us to use things rather than people. When we decide to just live simply and just it, be content with what we have, we start seeing people rather than things. See what I mean? Uh, we start seeing how we can use things to help people rather than how we can use people to help us. And that's another thing that pornography does is it makes people objects to us. See what I mean? And so we learn how to use people for our own desire. That's the, that's the basis of pornography. And so once again, it's a heart issue. It's not it's not the porn that's making us like this. We are like this. And so porn just fills the desire that we have in our hearts already. Um, so think about what you can do, not what you can't. A lot of times in these kinds of things, people think about, well, I can't give 80% of my income. I, I Well, I, I didn't say you had to give 80% of your income to, to the poor. I didn't say that. I, I, what I did say is think about what you can do, not what you can't. I was talking to you, to you guys about this a few weeks ago. There was this there's this older lady that I know that she's on a fixed income. She really can't give financially that much at all. She things are really tight for her. She didn't have any kind of retirement, and her husband was a a poor guy. You know, he just did kind of house labor. I mean, uh, yard labor his whole life. And when he died, she really didn't have much of anything. Uh, so she was on a fixed income. But one thing that she could do is she she made these little gift baskets for for women when they got pregnant. Well, just little things, you know, uh, she she sewed and whatnot, knitted, and all, I don't know the difference between sewing and knitting, but whatever, there's the one where it looks like, you know, that. Knitting? Um, 
Yeah, so she did that, and, you know, and it made little gift baskets and whatnot, and that, that's something that she could do. So, I mean, another thing that she did is she, she would make a little bit extra around Thanksgiving time, and then if there was anybody who didn't have a home to go to, she would invite them into her house. It wasn't much, but she could do it. So, you know I mean, focus on the things that you can do for the kingdom of God, not the things you can't do. If people only sat around thinking about the things they couldn't do, then Chuck would be wouldn't it wouldn't be the wouldn't be the pastor for the youth because oh I don't have working legs so that's just gonna be it. So I mean you can either focus on the things that you can do or you can whine and complain about the things you can't do. One is of great profit and the other one has no profit. So um, reanalyze your budget and your belongings. Maybe you're living outside of your means trying to trying to seek after something that you actually don't need, but you just think that you do. So reanalyze your budget. Can you cut out any spending anywhere? Can you save any money on anywhere on your bills? Gracie, um, our 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 car our car insurance was sixty one something, and Gracie was able to get it down down to thirty now. So I mean, reanalyze your budget. Can you cut anything out anywhere? Maybe instead of going with this phone plan that you you have to pay three hundred bucks for a month or however much it is, you can go with this one that you pay like sixty bucks a month or eighty bucks a month. See what I mean? Cut money where you can to things that that you know aren't necessary. Um, so we're gonna look at a few passages to kind of um, go on this idea. The first one's in Mark chapter seven. We're trying to teach Micah how to potty train and. Uh, so he doesn't have diapers on. So that's where she just went. Mark chapter 7, uh, verse 9 through 13 says, um, And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. Let me kind of set this up. They're trying to justify these people not providing for their, for their parents financially when there was no government assistance, remember. So literally, that was their only means of being provided in their older age. And, and rather than that, they were justifying them giving it to the temple instead. Okay, and this is what Jesus says. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles mother, father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban. In other words, whatever... Whatever I would have provided for you in your older age, so that you you could die. Oh, I mean, I mean, so that you you wouldn't die, so you'd be provided for. It's not it's not like yours now. It's God's. Um, that is given to God. Uh, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your traditions that you have handed down and many such things you do. So once again, putting, oh my religious pie, uh, my religious piety. I am such a good Christian. You know, I'm, I'm giving my money to the church. What could be more holy than that? But they were leaving their, their mothers and fathers in the lurch. In other words, it would have been better for them to not have given to the church so that they could have provided for their parents. See what he just said? It would have been better for that. But what he, they were doing is they were getting so focused on the money. James chapter 1 talks about something pretty similar. Um, and, and these are pretty powerful statements in, in James chapter 1. Check this out. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God. So if you really want to be a religious person, you want to be the, the top of the top, check this out. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction. So if you actually want to be someone, it's not about being someone. It's about reaching the very lowest in the society. It's about reaching people with the love of God. And here's the thing. If you're doing it to be noticed, then you're not actually reaching them with the love of God, are you? <laughs> if you're doing it to be that spiritually elite person, that means you're not actually doing it. See what I mean? And therefore, you wouldn't be a spiritual elite person. Um, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So, um, true religion is doing what's right with what you have. Doing what's right with what you have. That's true religion. It's not doing the perfect little routine. Um, so, just a few more things. Um, so, uh, uh, warnings, first off. Uh, can you give without controlling that person? When you're giving, can you give without trying to control the person? See, what you see in today's church is you see a lot of Christians who try to be so much better than the drug addict. They're so much better than the alcoholic. They're such good people. And yet, when it comes to their ties, they still think that they own part of the church. It's a, it's a company, and they've bought some, stuff, some socks. Well, that's not really how it works. Um, is giving at this time to this person a good thing or a bad thing? 
Well, sometimes you can actually hurt somebody by giving them rather than do good. I'll give you an example. There was somebody who was going to the men's meet, and Norval uh, decided to, to you know, help them out and, and pay for the meal for them, which was a good thing to do, right? But the person didn't take it like that, and, and they, they were ashamed that they couldn't pay him back, and so they just stopped coming to church in total. So, I mean, now, did Norval mean anything wrong by it? Well, no, he didn't mean anything wrong by it. But the person received it that way, and there's nothing Norval could do to change that. See what I mean? So is giving at this time to this person a good thing or a bad thing? Maybe it's a bad thing. Financial giving is not necessarily a good thing. You really have to kind of weigh it out. Um, um, are you justifying not giving with prudence? Oh, well, it's not prudent for me to be financially giving to this person. Well, now, hold on. I did just give you a warning that not that not that you shouldn't always just give money and stuff. I did talk about that. A lot of times giving money is a bad idea. However, sometimes... We justify not being a giving person by, oh, I'm. This is this is a this is a more prudent action, and so we 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 mask it as we're being wise when we're just being stingy with our money. See what I mean? And you have to really watch out for this because this is a, this is this one will get you. Where I'm just so smart, I'm above I'm above being fooled, and, and you're missing the person. Are you giving to be noticed or praised? Are you giving for the purpose of being noticed or praised? See what I mean? If if you want the person to thank you for it, if you want somebody to know, if you want, see what I mean? These these are examples of maybe you're giving to be noticed or praised, and not actually giving to give. Are you gonna say something? There was this one thing talking about these people that go on the missions trips and they they do it just to post the Facebook <laughs> pictures. Was that blimey cow? <laughs> I, uh, no, it, I forget what it was. I think it was relevant. Oh. <laughs> Look at how spiritual I am. Selfies. I went on a mission trip. I'm super spiritual. <laughs> not that they need water. Not, not that there's anything wrong with going on mission trips or even that there's anything wrong with posting pictures. But when, when your whole idea behind it is, look what I've done. I'm super awesome. I went to the Hurricane Katrina and did this. I was like, okay, all right. <laughs> So are you your own authority for your spending? Just a general rule, not that great of an idea. If you're single, I would recommend an accountability partner. Um, but just some way of, of making it where you're not the final authority on your money. <coughs> um, if you're not single, I would encourage your spouse, as you probably shouldn't hide your spending from your spouse. Just throwing it out there. Um, so... Um, are you thinking ahead? A good example of this is uh, uh, wills. I know a lot of parents who haven't written wills and then... Their, their kids turn into this big fight over the state when they could have just resolved it with an afternoon of writing out a will. This goes to you, this goes to you, problem solved. But instead, you, upon your death, you had a huge family tip to your heirs. So, I mean, are, are you thinking ahead with your giving? Are you thinking ahead? Um, and what are you teaching others? And ex uh, What I mean by this is, like, um, as a parent... We teach our kids how to respond to money. Are, are you? Do you not talk about money with your kids? Well, you might teach them how to fear money by avoiding it. See what I mean? You don't want to teach them how to fear it. You want to teach them how to manage it well. See what I mean? Obviously, I think taking a course on just Dave Ramsey is probably a mistake because you don't need to be highly trained on all things financial. But you do need to not run from it like it's something that, that – Oh, just deny it, and, and maybe it'll go away. You need to be realistic with your kids. And in the same way, I, I know uh, none of you guys have kids. So um, it, it still works with other things, though. You know what I mean? Where Got it. Um, it still works with other things, though, that we're always teaching people about greed. We're always teaching people from us. See what I mean? If I go out there and tell all of you guys... It's a sin to have more than one car, and then I have seven cars. Now, I already talked about this. It's not a sin to have multiple cars. I already talked about this. I'm just trying to give you guys examples of stuff. If I go out and tell you guys it's a sin to overeat, and then I go every single meal, and I'm overeating, and there's food dripping off my – well, you see what I mean? Like we're always teaching people around us, and, and we can't – we can't honestly think that's going to work. I um, mean, how this oftentimes works out is the parent is the child will compare themselves to the parent. Like for instance, if you're a messy person and you have a kid, and they go off and have their own house and it's a mess, but they'll they'll say something like this: "Well, it's a lot better than my parents had it." 
Well, you're not comparing yourself by yourself. That's a big mistake. You're trying to actually correct the problem. And that's, an, and that's a way that, that, that financially it, it bombards us. We don't handle our money well, and then our kids see that. And so they'll, they'll either go worse than you or better than you, but then they'll, they'll, uh, they'll compare themselves to what you've done. See what I mean? And that's just not a very healthy uh, pattern. So it's like if, if you don't have really anything good to say, just don't say anything. <laughs> Kinda, yeah. <laughs> okay. And so this is how it kind of works out. There's us, which is corrupt. We as people are, are corrupt. I mean, we're, we're, we're greedy. Eventually, something's going to happen in our lives, and we're going to be greedy with it, right? Um, and then there's money, which is poisoned anyways. And why is money poisoned? Anybody have any ideas why money is poisoned? Well, the money, I mean, you look around the world, and you see these people on TV, on, you know, and Poison just is just a real good word to be the uh, right beside the word money. Yeah. Because it's, this world is run run by money. Right there, there is what it is. That's why money is poisoned because the world sees it as poisoned. Therefore, the little piece of paper that literally meant nothing has now been given that that value to itself, which means now it is poisoned. See what I mean? It could be rocks. Rocks could be money, and then rocks would be bad. You see what I mean? Because the thing has become poisoned by our culture. And so then we are corrupt anyways, and so what, what's going to happen when those things meet? Inevitably, we will be deceived. We will, we will, we will be given, our, given over to greed. It's going to happen eventually. Why? Because you've got a poison thing with a corrupt forest. They're going to meet together. Nothing good's going to come from that. Greed will always reroot itself. Well, I've conquered greed in my in my life. Well, don't rejoice too long; it'll come back. Those two things. Yeah. Don't mix. Right. Uh, and, and greed is kind of a thing where where it doesn't matter how well you think you've mastered it; it'll resurface in another area in your life that you didn't even notice it's there. And oftentimes, you won't notice it's there even after it's there for till till later. Excuse me. Okay. So I think this is the last uh, slide. The, the process of greed, just wanted to show you this real quick. Money that leads to greed, which in turn leads to vengeance because you're trying to get back the, the losses that you've had in people, which leads to violence because people aren't just going to recoup your losses. I mean, see what I mean? So that means you're going to have to take matters into your own hands. But then there's this way that can happen. Money, which leads to generosity, which means leads to peace because the money, the loss of the money is okay. You're generous. See what I mean? So, simplicity and an, an, an abandonment of ownership starts the ball rolling. In other words, if you want this second way, money which leads to generosity and then peace, live these two simple principles. Simple, be okay with what you have. See what I mean? Don't always be chasing after the Joneses. Just be okay with – or Kardashians, I guess, now. Be okay with what you have now. See what I mean? But then the second step, get rid of ownership. It's the Lord's, not yours. Once you take those two easy steps, greed will be very much so put at bay in your life. Uh, and so that's the end of the lesson. But here's the question of the week. What is lust and how do you overcome it? A very, very heavy question. I hope you guys think think about it. It's for it's for the week. You have a whole week to think about it. Okay. I, 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 saw, I saw the ball rolling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought it's something to say about it. About the lust? Yeah, about the lust. Come next week. Right. Do it. Any questions about the lesson tonight? Or about greed in general? Okay, um, but don't... You're don't, thinking. Don't answer the, that question yet. No, we'll, ask, we'll answer that next week. Okay, but then you said... Uh, what has, what? Do you have any questions about greed or the lesson that we talked about tonight? I thought you said you have... Uh, Question about greed and lust. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so greed and uh, the other word. Uh, well, I lost my train of thought now. Oh, my the the lesson. lesson. Yes, the lesson. <laughs> Thank God for check. <laughs> well, I actually gave me something new to think about. Like, you know, from time to time, if you think about these things, and it made me feel of like, uh, 
But dang, well, maybe I was right. At one moment, I was thinking of some kind of problem or mm-hmm. a situation I was in. Yeah. Gracie, any questions? No, I'm going to have to go back to it. Nicole, no? Better? Okay, I'm going to...